Welcome everyone to the final How To Talks by Postdocs sponsored by the VCU Tompkins McCall Library, the Wright Center for Clinical and Translational Research, and the VCU Postdoctoral Association. Today I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Salvador Sierra. Dr. Sierra obtained his MD and his PhD from the University of Navarre. His PhD project is entitled Cannabinoid and Adenosine Heterimers in the Output Basal Ganglia and Nuclea in the macaco model of Parkinson's disease. After obtaining his degree, he joined the Lakshmi Devi lab at Mount Sinai. There he studied the interaction of cannabinoid 1 and delta opioid receptors. Recently, he, he joined VCU in the Gonzalez Mesa lab as a postdoc where he's exploring the epigenetic signature of cannabinoid and opioid receptors. Today, he'll discuss the proximity ligation assay that he's been working with for over 10 years for this talk. Let's welcome him. Thank you for this nice introduction. So first, I would like to thank the VC Library staff, especially Karen Gao, Rachel Koenig, Dr. Dillion, and Dr. Donaldson. And today, I'm going to share with you my experience with proximity ligation assay. So we will start by uh, showing you my, the index of my presentation. So first, I will talk about colocalization and how we use PLA or proximity ligation assay to detect it. Then I will move uh, to talk about the autofluorescence and how we can reduce it. And finally, I will talk a, a little bit about how to use PLA into epigenetics. So first, what do we mean by colocalization? Colocalization means co-occurrence, the spatial overlap of two probes or the co-distribution of one protein into another in the sample of interest. So basically, I show you here two proteins. Those are decoupled protein receptors or GPCRs. Those are proteins that have uh, seven tra transmembrane domains with an N and C terminal tails. So those protein A in red and protein B in green are together. We can say they are colocalizing. However, we cannot say that they are interacting each other and we do signaling or trafficking assays. And I'm going to show you one uh, uh, beautiful example of that. So GABA is the main inhibitory neuro transmitter through the central nervous system, and the target is the GABA B receptor, that is a GPCR as well. This receptor is comprised of two subunits, subunit B1 here in red and subunit B2. Only when the two subunits interact with each other, there is a, a migration of the receptor from the reticulum to the uh, plasma membrane, and there is a signal upon the activation by the venous ligand, GABA. So, what happens when we delete the um, subunit B, B2? So, the receptor will not reach the plasma membrane and will be locked into the re reticulum. What happens when we delete the subunit B1? The receptor will reach the plasma membrane, but we will not find any uh, signal response. So basically, it's a nice example to show what do we need to do when we want to show that there is a functional interaction. And uh, there are uh, experts in the field that propose three criteria to show the functional interaction uh, between two GPCRs. The first one is the colocalization of two proteins in the same cell and same subcellular compartment. And for that, we can apply a variety of techniques, including the PLA I'm going to talk today. The second criteria refers to the properties of the interacting proteins. For that, we use signaling, ligand binding, and trafficking assets. The third one refers to the loss of the protein-protein uh, interacting um, signaling or binding 
uh, properties. So for that, we use reagents that create the interaction, showing that there is a loss of the properties we, we already saw in the criteria two. So among all of the three criteria, the most important one is the criteria one. And this is the one I'm going to talk during this uh, presentation. So the most widely used technique to show colocalization is immunofluorescence. Here is an indirect immunofluorescence where we use two primary antibodies against our targets. Those are raised in different species, and the secondary antibodies are tagged with fluorophores. One for the red, and one for the green channel. We will say there is a colocalization when there is an overlap of the green and red channels, so we will see our signal in yellow when they colocalize. Another antibody-based technique is the co-immunoprecipitation, or co-IP. Basically, we use our antibody of interest against the protein 1, and we pull down the lysate uh, by using beads. After that, we wash and we elute, and we, do, uh, we run our sample in a gel. And we obtain the different weight uh, depending on the interaction of the proteins. And then there is another technique uh, widely used in, in these days. It's called Fred and Bread. Basically, we use proteins that are that with luminous ten or fluorescent proteins, and whenever those proteins are close enough, the donor molecule here in blue will transfer the energy to the acceptor molecule, and we will measure the light and uh, obtain this uh, saturation, sa sa saturation uh, curve. But the most important technique to show Colocalization is immune electron microscopy. Basically, we use our primary antibodies and the secondary antibodies are going to be tagged with different size particles. So whenever we find uh, two different size particles in our sample that are close enough, we will say that there is a colocalization. And here I summarize all the techniques with the advantages and drawbacks uh, for all the techniques used to show colocalization. As I said, the widely used one is immunofluorescence, but the resolution is very poor. The immunoprecipitation tells us that two proteins are in the same immunocomplex, but it doesn't mean that there is a direct interaction. Immunoelectron staining, as I said, is the gold standard for colocalization. However, is technically difficult and expensive. Fred and Brett give us a very close resolution to the immune electron. The problem is that we usually do the, the, these experiments in vitro, and we are adding molecules that are not in the native uh, system, cells or tissue. And then I'm going to focus today about the, the proximity ligation assay. We can we can obtain a very good resolution close to Fred uh, to detect protein-protein localization, and most importantly, we can apply this technique in both cells and tissue. However, as any other antibody-based technique, if our antibodies are not good, it's not going to work. Right? So, a brief introduction to uh, PLA. Uh, this technique was developed uh, by the early uh, 2000 and it was published in these two <coughs> papers. So, in the last 10 years, the numbers of papers using PLA to show colocalization has doubled, as you see here. And I'm going to show you just the basics of, of PLA and then I will go in detail through the experiment the protocol in cells as well as in tissue. So basically, we incubate our sample where our protein 1 and protein 2 are colocalizing with our primary 
antibodies raised in different species, let's say mouse and rabbit. Then we incubate our sample with the secondary antibodies that are tagged to a oligonucleotide. And those are complementary each other. So they are called GLA probes and they are targeting the species of the primary antibodies. As you see here, anti-mouse and anti rabbit Then there is a ligation step where we basically use a ligase to make a circle template in order to uh, join those two oligonucleotides. And in the last step, a polymerase will make several copies of this template and fluorescent label oligonucleotides will hybridize to the amplification. There are two variations of this technique. Let's say we do have two antibodies that raise the same species, rabbit, and of course we cannot apply the secondary antibodies to target because they, they are going to bind both ones. So we can uh, link the oligonucleotides directly to the primary antibodies. And the problem is that it's quite expensive. And then, imagine we do have an antibody that gives us a very high background. We can use the single recognition approach to increase the signal to noise ratio. In any case, we are going to find a signal which is a fluorescent red dot like as you see here. Of course, if you use another fluorophore, it might change. So, I'm going to talk about the protocol. I usually do in two days. It depends on the timing you incubate your primary antibody. You can use cells, fix plus minus frozen tissue, and formalin fix, paraffin, embed, or FFP uh, sections. So basically, we printed our sample. I will go through that later. Then we block one hour at 37. We might use the blocking reagent from the company or ours. Then we incubate overnight at 4 degrees with our antibody. The next day we wash with a buffer which, may, which uh, contains sodium chloride, trees and twin 20 as a detergent. And we incubate our sample with the PLA probes one hour at 37. Then we wash again and we incubate with uh, ligase for half to one hour at 37. And then we wash again and we perform the amplification where we will obtain several copies of the template uh, we obtain in the ligation step. And then we just need to eye dry our samples completely and cover Sleep by using a multi medium with DAPI. After that, we have to go to the confocal microscope to obtain our images. So, I'm going to give you some tips about the pre treatment in cells. So, I usually grow my cells in the 16 well chamber slide or in the chamber cover glass. I don't re recommend you to use a over SDs to grow your cells for three reasons. First, they are very fragile and they get they break quite easily. Second, the surface is bigger than the well we use for the chamber slide and we are going to use more reagent. And as you might know, the PLA reagents are not very cheap. And the third one, one of the critical um, things with PLA is that your sample shouldn't get dry during the, the procedure. So we, by using the cover sleeves, they usually get dry. Then there are some cells that are easily detached from the well. So for example, hex cells, I usually coat with poly devices. However, maybe with CHO cells, you won't do it. And then it's very important that when you save your cells into the wells, the Confluency is 
around 40 to 50 percent. So you can see perfectly well the border of the cells. If we have a very low confluence with a bad mo mo morphology or a mono layer, it's going to be difficult for us to count the dots uh, in the sample. Now I'm going to go through the pre treatment for the cells. So here we do have our chamber slide. I usually don't use the wells that are in the side of the slide. Basically, because if you work with an inverted confocal microscope, these sites will get, um, the objective will get stuck and you will not be able to see these wells. So, we use our medium, we're with, uh, our serum and the antibiotics, we incubate for two to three days, depending on the morphology of the cells and the confluence. Then we gently wash with a pipette with PDS. Then we fix by using PFA at 15 minutes room temperature. And then we detach the plastic uh, frame so we can uh, wash our a slide in a coupling yarn with PBS. At this step, the cells would not detach because they are fixed. And we don't want to pipe it again because it, it will increase the, the chance for the cells to get out of the well. Then we wash with a buffer which contains glycine in order to quench the aldehyde groups. We do that to get rid of our reduce the autofluorescence. Then we pernualize by using Triton X100. And finally, we wash again with PBS to get rid of the detergent. And we follow the PLA protocol as I showed before. So this is the expected results we should have. Here is the positive control. We have our cells with the two proteins of interest and we can see the red dots in all of them. The negative control, we can make several. One is like avoiding the primary antibody. So this is a control for the background of the, text of the technique. Or you can use cells where there is a lack of one of the proteins of interest. So you get the background, uh, which is a, a slightly higher. And here is another example. So here are cells that express the both proteins of interest. In the second column, we avoid one of them. And in the third, we avoid the other. And then we can count the number of dots per cell. I usually count 30 cells per condition. And I like to, re to replicate my experiment at least three times to make sure that the results are real. <coughs> so we can also combine our PLA um, experiment with markers, especially when we want to explore where the interaction takes place. For example, we can use phalloidin, which is an F-acting marker, to visualize the cytoskeleton of the cell. We can also use the Bachmann 2.0 technology by uh, adding the reagent into the living cells uh, the night before. So this baculovirus will express DFP into the plasma membrane. And also, if we, if we want to detect the lysosomes, we can use an antibody targeting LAMP1. And in this case, as you see in the white arrows, the overlap of the PLA signal and the um, lysosome marker give us a yellow signal. I've, um, I've used some markers we usually use for living cells, like lyso tracker. In my hands, it didn't work. However, my tracker works with, with PLA. And now I'm going to move into the uh, tissue samples. So I'm going to start with the FFP samples. We usually 
do a high hydration step where we uh, immerse our sample inside it in a series of ethanol and finally water. Then we do an antigen re retrieval and permeabilization step where we heat our um, sample in sodium cycle with 20 for 10 minutes at 95 to 100 degrees. Then we wash and air dry and we encircle our sample by using a hydrophobic pen. So whenever, when, um, so we will keep our uh, reagents when we do the PLA in our sample. Now talk about the fixed and frozen samples. We throw our cryo bio, then we wash in PBS to get rid of the cryo pro 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 protection solution. And then we mount our sample by using a buffer with gelatin, so it makes easier to mount the uh, tissue. And then we finalize by using X100. The rest of the steps are very similar to the previous uh, protocol. And this is the expected results we should have. This is a section of the brain, the basolateral amygdala, and you can see how there are cells that are full of red dots, whereas others do not have. So it means that the, this technique is showing specifically where the protein-protein localization takes place. And we are going to compare this with the localization we usually do with immunofluorescence. And here is the result. So for this protein, GPR171, we use the green channel. For the GPR83, we use the red channel. And the overlap tells us the uh, localization. However, as you see, the signal is very blurry. And it's difficult to, to say which cells are expressing both proteins. However, PLA gives us a better resolution and a more reliable protein-protein localization that makes it easier to count the number of these localizations by the number of dots. Also, we can combine with another marker, given that we also have the green and the far red channel to do that. And also, as I told you, we can combine with other Marker. So this is a, a inset of a section uh, from the human, and I use a marker for neurohealing receptor one combined with PLA. And in the right figure, I use a GFAP antibody to la uh, to label the astrocytes, and uh, you can see the PLA signal in the cytoplasm and close to the nucleus. So, some tips I would like to uh, comment with you is that choose a marker that is not raised in the same species as the PLA probes. Let's say you use um, your proteins of interest and you use the antibodies raised in mouse and rabbit. For the marker, you will use a goat or a guinea pig or a chicken, right? So incubate all together. You don't need to split the experiments. Incubate uh, all together at four degrees overnight. Then the secondary antibody, you can uh, add to the PLA probes in the step of one hour. I recommend you that the secondary antibody is raising donkey because the PLA probes are. And also link with a fluorophore for the green channel, if possible. And make, make sure that the secondary antibody is not raised in, um, in a, a species targeted by the PLA probes. Let's say that the secondary, the secondary antibody for this marker is raised in gold, but one of the PLA probes is targeting gold. So we will get an artificial signal. And also, we can do PLA combined with electron microscopy. Basically, instead of using fluorescent label 
oligonucleotides, we use peroxidase labeled oligonucleotides. And then we incubate our sample with gold, with an antibodies tagged with gold particles. And as you see in the image, every dot means the localization of two proteins. In this case, D1 and D2 receptors. And we can see that those are in the Golgi. So the summary for this part is that DNA is a powerful antibody-based technique for detecting protein-protein localization in both in vitro and ex vivo. Also, contrary to other techniques, you don't need a lot of training and it allows quantification. And third, you can detect where the protein-protein localization takes place in a subcellular compartment. So, there is any question for, for this part? Okay, I will do the next um, part. So, this is an image of uh, PLA in the red, red channel combined. Yes. This is a PLA experiment combined with the new end in the green channel and DAPI for the nucleus. Anyone want to say something about this? Okay, where are the red dots? There are none, right? No. But there are yellow dots. There is not any yellow channel here. Okay. Anyone has any idea what's happening here? Okay, yeah, sure. Yellow is the red. Yellow is the red? Yeah. What, what do you mean by that? Like, it combined with uh, another... I know. Yeah, that's what I thought. So, yeah, so maybe if I understood you well, so the PLA was overlapping with a signal from the new end, right? Oh. So that's why it is yellow. Yeah, that's what I thought. However, I show you this image and there is no yellow dots. You can see some yellow, but it's mostly red. Okay, so what happened here is that it didn't work. PLA, for some reason, it didn't work. I didn't add my primary antibodies or whatever, but it didn't work. So, this is auto fluorescence, and I'm going to introduce you to this new guy, or old guy, because we're going to probably have to deal with this if we work in, you know, fluorescence. So, when we fix our cells or tissue with PFA or any other fixative like rutaraldehyde or some samples like elastin or red blood, blood cells that contain hemosiderin have autofluorescent itself. And as you see here, this sample ha ha has not been treated with any fluorophore or antibody. And we can see a dot like signal in all three channels, green, red, and far red. And they are in the same uh, location. Also, if we use human and age animals, we can find this uh, signal, which is called lipofustin. Lipofustin is a protein that is accumulating the lysosomes as we get older. And you can see the signal, here is a pseudo color um, image in all channels from blue, green, to red, and far red. So how do we, how do we uh, face this, especially when our signal is gonna be a top? So I've been using several treatments in my hands, so then Black D was the best one. And I'm going to show you how I, uh, could use it in order to reduce the present signal. So
So here is a, a section of the mice in the estriarum, which is the deep brain. And here I didn't it with any fluorophore or marker. And you can see these dots we, which are present when we just uh, um, take our pictures with the four channels. If we split our channels, we don't see that in the blue channel. I must say that here I use a uh, mountain medium with dapping, so we see the nucleus, but we don't see those dots, right? But we can see them in the green, red, and far red channel. If we use Sudan black pea, again, no antibodies, no markers, we get rid of this dot-like signal. However, we have some background, mostly coming from the far red channel. So whenever we use Sudan Black B, I recommend, if possible, to work with green and red channel and leave the red, red channel for PLA. Now I'm going to combine this with a regular immunofluorescence for BGLU2 and a secondary antibody with a fluorophore for 568, similar to the PLA1. And you can see how the signal is mostly in the red channel, not in the far red, even though there is some background here, not in the green, not in the blue channel. And what about the human sections, the FFP, the lipofuscin? So here is a section of the rat estriarum for uh, an HUA receptor in the green channel. When we do the same experiment with the same antibody in the human estriarum, we get this yellow brownish dot-like uh, signal. And when we split the channels, we can see the signal in the blue, red, green, and sorry, I didn't um, get the far red, but it's supposed that it will be there as well. And we are, we are going to do PLA by using Sudan Black B. So here is the positive control in which for PLA, we didn't use Sudan Black B. And we get this dot thread-like signal coming from lipofustin, but also dot signal, which is very weak here compared to lipofustin. To get rid of this ugly signal, we use Sudan Black B after the PLA experiment, and we get these dots nicely here. And most of the auto presence is gone. There is some, but it doesn't really interfere with our experiment. And here is the negative control. So how do we prepare the Sudan Black B? We basically dissolve our powder in ethanol. We stir at room temperature overnight. We filter the next day. And we incubate our slides after the PLA wash for 10 minutes at room temperature in an orbital shaker. And then we just wash with a buffer 0.01x three times. And I recommend to use a jet uh, into the sample to get rid of the, any particle from the Sudan like pea. So, the summary of this part is that you should always check your auto fluorescence whenever you do an um, experiment that involves the use of fluorescent markers. And I recommend to use splicing in order to um, reduce the auto fluorescence for cells before the experiment and Sudan black tea in order to get rid of the PFA or lipofustin uh, auto process. Any questions here? So what? could you use it in black for <clears throat> any sort of cell line? Like, because before you were using a different type of dye, I mean, why don't you just use pseudo black and not use any other dye at all? You mean for cells? Yes, for cells. Well, for cells, I never used Sudan 
like the activer, right? right? I must say that when I use glycine, for me, it works. So I don't really use some black bead of cells. Okay, so you use glycine for everything, but pseudo black is just for those cells that you know have some oligofluorescence. I just don't know why pseudo black, you just can't use it for everything, if it has oligofluorescence or not. Yeah, so I'm not the expert on that, but people who have been working in histology, they have tried many protocols. They use sodium borohydrate, glycine, they use uh, sulfate cupron, sulfate black B, max block is a commercial one, and they show their images, and sulfate black B is the best one. Why? I don't know. It's very dirty, so you need to use gloves, and I guess it also reduced your fluorescence from your um, marker, but mostly it gets rid of the fluorescence you don't want for your experiment. Okay. Okay. So now I'm going to switch a little bit. So I'm going to show you how we can apply PLA for epigenetics. So briefly, epigenetics is the science that studies the the heritable changes in gene expression, either activation or repression, uh, that doesn't involve the changes in the DNA sequence. So the first level of organization of the DNA strand is around the histones. Histone proteins uh, um, control the access of the tra transcription machinery into the DNA region. And for the histone to move, it needs some uh, modifications into the amino acid group. The most common ones are acetylation, demethylation, ubiquitinization. And the common technique we use is called CHIP or chromatin immunoprecipitation. So we basically uh, take our lysate and we cross link by using a PFA. After that, we isolate and shear our DNA. We pull down our protein histone bind to the DNA by using an antibody and bits. And then we reverse cross-link to get just the DNA and do a real-time PCR. And what we get is a graph where we uh, get um, the histone modification. Here is a trimethylated histone 3 in the lysine 4 for the gene A, whereas the negative control with IgG is very low. And this means just what I said. However, CHIP does not permit the analysis of these histone modifications in a given gene locus in individual cells, especially when we use tissues that have a heterologous population of cells. And there is a quite new paper showing how we can detect this histone modification in specific cells by using PLA. Basically, we need to design a DNA probe labeling the gene promoter, and it will be labeled with biotin. Then we use an antibody against the histone modification of interest, and an antibody against biotin. And we just do the protocol I showed you before. And here is the proof of concept for this technique. So basically, we isolate a smooth muscle cells from the artery and endothelial cells. And by doing cheap, we see that this histone modification is only present in a smooth muscle cells. So we check by chip. Now we're going to see if we can demonstrate this by doing PLA in the native tissue. And we show here that before the nucleus, PLA in the red channel, 
Our tattoo is a marker for the smooth muscle cells and CD31 for the endothelial cells in the inner um, region. And we can see how these dots are just in the outer region of the artery. So they are just in the smooth muscle cells here also in the insect. So it, it, this is telling us that PNA can detect specific histone modifications in, the, in certain or specific cells. So as a summary of this part, uh, CHIP is a powerful technique to detect histone modifications at cells and tissues. Uh, however, it doesn't allow us to characterize ex vivo uh, tissues. In situ, PLA will be a useful tool for the investigation of the specific cellular subtypes carrying these epigenetic modifications. The bad news, contrary to PLA, in situ, PLA is a challenging technique where we need to combine in situ immunomarkers and PLA. So every condition should, could potentially interfere with one another. And I would like to thank uh, the previous lab, the lab at Mount Sinai, where I did most of the experiments I show you here. And also my current lab, where I'm trying to develop this in situ PLA technique. So if you have any questions, if not, uh, feel free to contact me at any time. Thank you. I asked you right at the end there, where you're trying to target, my understanding of the, that at the end was you're trying to target a specific gene by having a DNA sequence in biotin. Yeah. How close does that DNA sequence have to be to the promoter region or, you know what I mean, if you're trying to look yeah. at the promoter? Yeah, so basically, region? you need to do in situ. Right? Yeah. So, if in situ works, the histone, the histone modification is going to be uh, detected if it's there. So, I usually do first chip. So, you do chip. If that works, I will probably use this antibody to do the in situ PLA. But first, you need to make sure that your in situ is working. And that's, right. I think, the most challenging part for this. And so the chip probe that you use, you can use that to make the DNA for the biotin. Is that right? So the no. So the for chip we use the antibody. Yeah, yeah. It's the same one. What I usually do is I test if the antibody works also for immuno. Right. So I check if just in a sample if my histone modification antibody targets the nuclei of the sample, yeah. and then the in situ. So by using this PLA tool, can we identify the new, uh, I mean, new protein interacting partner of our interest? The new? I mean, can we identify the new protein interacting partners by using this PLA tool? You mean the regular PLA or the in situ PLA? No, the regular PLA. Yes. An unknown protein? Yes, yes. Well, you need your antibody, right, to target your protein. Yes, no, we know the antibody, but we don't know whether the complex is still uh, associated with the protein of interest or not. Yeah, I mean, um, so, I mean, I would probably do do first a uh, test in vitro, and if that works, I will go through PLA. Because we tried with the pull down experiment, looks like the <coughs> somehow uh, the, you know, the complex is less stable with that, our interest of protein. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't bring it down with our regular pull down uh, protocol. You mean to pull down your proteins in order to do that? Yes. Rather to quality, maybe it's cheaper. Yes. If it yes. works, yes. I will do in a section of tissue with PLA. Right? I think it makes more 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 sense to do that. There is also, I mean, there are many variations of the, these techniques. So some people is doing ELISA PLA, so you can also detect by ELISA 
We can deduct the LSA only if the antibody is very few, right? In case if they are deducting some non specific, in that case. Yeah, of course. I mean, this is an antibody based on So if your antibodies are not good enough or are not specific enough, they are not going to work. Even though if the background is high but is specific, with PLA, you can increase the signal to noise ratio by doing the PLA single okay. recognition. But you want to see the interaction, right? Specific interaction. Yeah. And one more question. So, what's the the PLA probe? Are you making or you are? Uh, oh yeah. So I didn't say that uh, PLA was first developed by a Swedish company, Olink, and then it was bought by Mediport Sigma. So you buy the all the reagents, the PLA probes, the blocking reagent, the mounting medium from Mediport Sigma. The buffers I don't usually buy from them. I okay. use I do my own because they are. So. so how expensive like the PLA probe is it inexpensive? Or yeah, so the PLA probes, yeah, the PLA probe uh, is around three hundred to four hundred dollars each. Yeah. So but in case if you want to test one particular protein, you need to buy one PLA probe. It's yeah. So like that. Yeah. So I see. Let's say that you are using your antibody for tightening your protein of interest and is raising rabbit. And the other one is raising gold. You need two PLA probes, one anti rabbit, one anti gold. So you need to buy two. Right? Of course, uh, I mean, you can do a lot of reactions. The amount of reagent I add is very low. So I cover one spinal cord section of the mice with just 20 microliters. And the dilution for the PLA probes is 1 into 5. So, and if you get one vial of the PLA probe, you 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 have one milliliter. So, mm -hmm. yeah. As long as you use the hydrophobic pen, you keep your reagent there. You don't need to add a lot of something. Lot of, uh, so, how how we can quantitate uh, this PLA assay results? I mean, how oh, we can well, the quantity? Yeah, I didn't show you here. Well, yes, you're right. So, in this protocol, we show how to do it with um, image A. So you can count the dots in one cell, and then do your, your statistics. I also do deconvolution with image J. So yeah, maybe so you don't need to pay for that. Yeah, but does it significantly differ, differ from the co-localization like immunofluorescence experiments? Well, I, that's a good question. I haven't done the. I, I haven't checked the localization, so I haven't measured the localization by doing regular immunofluorescence and doing PLA. I haven't done it, but I, for me, it's easier to count dots instead of intensities, overlap intensities. And also, the overlap doesn't mean that they are close enough. Yes. As I said, yes. the localization could be very unreliable. Nowadays, with the super the super resolution microscopes, you can go like lower than 250 nanometers, but you cannot get 40 or 17 nanometers of proximity. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> if you want to know a single protein, I want to know the localization. Instead of using RSA, you just using the PLA. Can you use? Two different antibody targeted to different yes. uh, epitope, then, yes. then do PLA. What the advantage of using that to localize your protein? You can do it, yes. Absolutely. So, yes, uh, well, we'll teach you over, but yeah, so. Yeah, so you can use one antibody. Uh, so, you want to detect. Uh, with an antibody against one epitope and the other antibody targeting the other epitope. So it would do something like that. So one is raised in rabbit and one is raised in mouse or in goat, right? Basically, okay. it's, a, it's the same as this because here we just need one primary antibody targeting one epitope. But for your experiment, it would do that. Okay, so that single recognition can also work if you just have one antibody, but the second antibody you have two different 
Yeah, they probe, so yes, so it works also. both are anti the species, but one is the PLA pros uh, is plus and one and the other is minor. So you need to put pros that are complementary. Otherwise, there is a competition between those two secondary. There is competition. Yes. There is a competition, right? Yeah. So yeah, they are that's a problem. Polyclonal, but yes, there is a, a, a competition. You're not gonna get like a full yeah, all right. And also for for the the <coughs> suspension cell to do PLH, uh, to using subtle spin to spin down to the glass or... Good question. Yes, you can do it. I, th I haven't done it yet, but it has been published. So I cannot give you that information, but yes, it, it, it has been done. Yeah. Well, if there are any questions, we'd like to thank Salma for his presentation here.